Hi guys, my name is Faridan. Welcome to the pathology section again, and today we're going to discuss oncogenes. I would suggest that you watch this lecture in conjunction with the immune evasion of cancer and hallmarks of cancer, as this will tie in a lot of the concepts that we learned together and make it much more understandable for you. So we're now going to discuss how cancers develop on a molecular level. We talked about how DNA can be altered and how this can lead to cancer. Now we're going to look at it how in a molecular level this happens. We'll do this through an animation of discussing normal steps, and in each step involved, we'll discuss the molecules involved and how it can lead to particular cancers. Now, DNA mutations can progress into full-blown cancers either by increasing proliferation or decreasing suppression. So think of it at this way. You're driving a car. You could either step harder on a gas and make it go faster, or just let go of the brake. Both of this will lead to a car moving faster, and this is how DNA mutations and mutations in a molecular level lead to cancer. Now, we're going to talk about oncogenes and proto-oncogenes particularly. Proto-oncogenes are normal genes in our body and have certain functions to support cell growth and proliferation. However, one simple mutation in one allele can convert these genes into oncogenes. So remember, oncogenes, one mutation. So the way I would remember it is one so both start with an O. So oncogenes, one mutation. On the other hand, tumor suppressor genes are very important for our cells to fight cancers. You need to suppress both of the alleles, so two mutations, in order to the tumor suppressor gene to lead to cancer. Neoplastic cells try to suppress these tumor suppressor genes by making them dysfunctional. So you could either have progression of neoplasia in one mutation in proto-oncogene or two mutations in tumor suppressor genes. Categories of oncogenes include growth factors, growth factor receptors, signal transducers, nuclear regulators, and cell cycle regulators. Let's take a look at it closely. Now, here we have a growth factor, and we have a receptor down there. So you have a growth factors, can you do cellular growth? Thus, increased activity of your growth factors will meet to increase growth of your cell. Tell me about a specific growth factor oncogene that increases your chance of astrocytomas. If you said platelet-derived growth factor, you would be correct. And then growth factor receptors transmit signals from growth factors to tell the cell that there needs to be some kind of a growth. So you have a growth factor and you have a receptor. So if you have a mutation in the receptors and you have more receptors, that means as the growth factor attaches it, you will have more signal transduction. Can you tell me what receptor is associated with a decreased prognosis in certain breast cancers? And there's a specific antibody that treats it. If you said herb B2 or HER2 new, you would be correct. And the antibody that is targeted against that receptor is trastuzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. After the growth factor is bound to the growth factor receptor, a tyrosine kinase which is here, this is our tyrosine kinase receptor. Tyrosine kinase, it attaches to the receptor, phosphorylates to the base of the receptor. What type of mutation increased tyrosine kinase activity in chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, and what chromosomes are involved with it? Well, the specific translocation that we talk about is the ABL gene from chromosome 9, and it gets placed on chromosome 22 with the BCR gene and leads to constitutive phosphorylation of these receptors without the need for growth factors, growth factor receptors. Essentially, you're just eliminating this part of the equation and this here is always active. It doesn't need any stimulation from the receptor itself. And it's very commonly tested on USMLE and because you need to understand a mechanism and also there's a monoclonal antibody that targets that receptor. Do you know what it is? Well, if you said imatinib, you would be correct. In fact, imatinib is used to treat other type of cancers, particularly in the GI tract. The big one is called GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And it's because the mutation in what's called the CKIT causes mutation in the tyrosine kinase making it active all the time. And imatinib blocks that receptor. So think of imatinib for CML and think of imatinib for GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Other tyrosine kinase that's associated that shows up on your exam is called the ALK gene. Don't confuse it with alkaline phosphatase. This is all written in big letters. 
It stands for anaplastic lymphoma kinase. But the best way to remember it, I think, is how your book lays it out. Adenocarcinoma of the lung kinase. So quick review of adenocarcinomas. Who gets it more, men or women? If you said woman, you would be correct. Do you need a smoking history? No. Does it happen in the central chest or in the periphery? It mainly happens in the peripheral lung. Now, it has a tropism or likes to metastasize it to a certain organ. Do you know what organ that is? If you said adrenal gland, you would be correct. Now, nowadays, they check this ALK levels in certain adenocarcinomas. Now, why does that matter for your exam? Well, because there is an antibody associated that can be treated in people who have abnormal ALK levels. And that drug is crizotinib. Crizotinib. ALK crizotinib. Now, the way I remember it from medical school is I just remembered it as crizalk. I don't know how, but this is how I remembered it. So I would remember ALK and your crizotinib as one of the receptors that you need to know. Now, the other receptor tyrosine kinase that gets tested frequently is the red proto-oncogene. The red proto-oncogene mutation causes what two um, high-yield syndromes? Well, if you said MEN2A and MEN2B, you will be correct. Now, recall your MEN2A have your parathyroid cancers, pheochromocytoma, and medullary thyroid cancers, and your MEN2B have pheochromocytoma, medullary thyroid cancer, and mucosal ganglionomas or morphinoid habitus. Now, let's go down our normal pathway again. You have the growth factor attached into a receptor, which activates your tyrosine kinase. And a phosphorylation of that tyrosine kinase leads to stimulation of the RAS protein that replaces your GDP with GTP. So this makes RAS a GTPase. Overactivation of the RAS protein is implicated in many cancers, particularly in colon cancer. And that's where they like to test you on it. A cousin of the RAS protein is also called KRAS, is implicated in colon, lung, and pancreatic cancer. They tend to test you this on more of the colon cancer. Remember the specific mutation sequences in colon adenocarcinoma? Well, it was APC first, KRAS, P53. And then the way you would remember this is your AK53 mnemonic that you have in the book. Your APC, your KRAS, and your P53 gene. You have an activator of RAS that has a GTP bound to it, which then stimulates your MAP kinase cascade, then ultimately results in the synthesis of a transcription factor that's called MYC, M-Y-C. There's an importance that this is a transcription factor. This means that once it's phosphorylated and activated, it travels to the nucleus and you know, leads down to cell proliferation. Now, you have an increased activity of several different types of mix that's associated with certain cancers. There is C-MYC, there is N-MYC, and there is L-MYC. And they are associated with... C-MYC is associated with Burkitt's lymphoma. N-MYC is associated with neuroblastoma. And L-MYC is associated with lung cancer. So... Don't get confused if they say NMIC or MIC. N, that's the same thing. They could also tell you LMIC or they could tell you it's MIC L1. Same thing. Different names does the same thing. So NMIC, MIC N, LMIC, MIC L1, they're the same thing. What's a specific CMIC mutation that leads to Burkitt's lymphoma and what chromosomes are involved in that? Well, if you said the C-MYC gene from chromosome 8, which is translocated onto the gene coding for a heavy chain, which is located on chromosome 14, so think about it. You have your uh, B cells that, and your plasma cells that make antibodies all the time. And every time you make an antibody, you need that heavy chain. And with that heavy chain, every time you synthesize an antibody, you also make a MYC protein, which is a transcription factor that causes cell proliferation. Every time you make an antibody, you will have increased proliferative factor and lead to dramatically increased proliferation of that cells, and that's how you get Burkitt's lymphoma. How does MYC work? We said it's a transcription factor. Importantly, 
It's a transcription factor for cyclin D. What depends on cyclin for its kinase activity? Well, if you did say cyclin-dependent kinase, or CDK, you will be correct. What does CDK do? So a cyclin goes with CDK, they make a complex, and together they phosphorylate your retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein, and which releases your E2F. E2F helps your cell cycle progress through. And there is a specific cell cycle point that they like to test you on, on the US, USMLE. Can you tell me which checkpoint it is in? Well, if you said G12S, which is a key checkpoint for E2F, you would be correct. And remember, S stands for the synthesis and where the DNA synthesis occurs the most. Let's talk about other types of tyrosine kinases. So we talked about a normal pathway. The one that I like to talk to you about that shows up on your exams is the tyrosine kinase receptor called JAK2 receptor. Here it's called JAK. So remember, tyrosine kinase phosphorylates a secondary messenger inside the cell. So here, this is, was your tyrosine kinase and it phosphorylates. We changed the name here and we call it specifically the JAK2 tyrosine kinase. In this case, it phosphorylates and leads to the activation of secondary messenger called STAT. You might have heard in your uh, lecture the JAK STAT pathway. Here we talked about how it phosphorylates RAS, but here we are talking specifically uh, it phosphorylates the STAT protein. So then STAT protein, when phosphorylated, migrates into the nucleus and causes transcription of proteins. One particular protein that it likes to uh, cause a proliferation of is called the BCL protein. Do you remember where BCL protein is very important in? If you said the apoptosis pathway, you would be correct. Now, JAK2 mutation is associated with myeloproliferative disorders. Particularly which one? Correct, polycythemia vera. This makes sense, right? Because if you have a mutated JAK protein that's always phosphorylating your STAT protein, so your STAT protein is always active, goes inside the nucleus, and it makes BCL protein, that means if you have a lot of BCL protein, which is anti-apoptotic, so you don't undergo apoptosis, your cells don't die. And it makes sense. In polycythemia vera, you have a lot of more cells that are there that should have not been there, and you have uh, mutated cells. And this is how you get polycythemia vera. Now you understand how the mechanism works. For our ending of our lecture, let's talk about serine threonine kinase mutation. And there's one specific gene that's associated with this serine threonine kinase pathway, and it's the BRAF gene. So the BRAF gene that gives you a mutation serine threonine kinase. Now, the so image here shows how a typical protein kinase works. And all it does is it takes a phosphate from an ATP here, and it puts it on a protein kinase, and uh, that's all it does. A serine threonine kinase is all it does, it takes that protein, uh, this phosphate puts it in serine or threonine. That's it. Let's just keep it simple. Now, this phosphorylin protein can affect multitude of growth factors inside cells and cause neoplastic growth. In the case of BRAF, the reason that you need to know this is because it's high yield with melanoma, particularly, also non-Hodgkin lymphoma, papillary thyroid cancer, and hairy cell leukemia. Now, I said pay particular attention to melanoma and hairy cell leukemia. Why would this BRAF and serine threonine kinase come up on your studies? Well, because there's a specific drug that's associated with it. It's called vemurafenib. Vemurafenib. And the way I remember this is with a mnemonic called vemurafenib. So vemu... All right. So this is where the serine threonine kinase and the BRAF mutation comes in important. Think of melanoma, think of BRAF inhibitors, and think of a drug called vemurafenib. And the way I remember it is vemurafenib. So this wraps our lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Just like I said, I hope you guys tied this in with your um, immune evasion of cancer and hallmarks of cancer lecture. And, uh, and that, that will tie in all these concepts and make it uh, a lot more sense to you. Hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. If you did, give it a thumbs up below and leave some comments. Thank you.